So we've always been big believers that human capital is the key to India's success. We are all from five different states. If you speak in a native language, you will not be able to understand each other. So in India, language becomes a divide. Can it become a bridge through technology? Content that you need for the learning of students, for training of teachers, etc., etc., and so many different languages, so many boards, grades, mediums, subjects. You need diversity. We leading. Uh, the world when it comes to digital capital uh, but the human capital still has to unlock itself. We think childhood itself is the biggest teacher. We have to let our children learn from childhood itself. Let adults remember the child in themselves. The world seems to have changed and I would say in our country, uh, if someone who's played the role to make it happen, it's you. Uh, tell us about this idea and tell us how do you see this manifesting because today the digital capital that you know, you've helped architect and create has changed our lives. But where, where do you see it manifesting in the years to come? What we have today, we broadly classify under the title of digital public infrastructure. And the idea is that you build things at population scale. So it should be for a billion people, 1.4 billion people. It should uh, build, build, you build different things, but each of them does one thing well. And then make sure that they all combine together well so that they can create new opportunities. And that's been the philosophy. It began with, of course, with Aadhaar. 1.3 billion people have it today. It's used 80 million times a day. Then Aadhaar led to KYC, which allowed you to open bank accounts and connect mobile phones. So the whole inclusion of people into financial inclusion, mobile happened, KYC helped in that. Then the DBT helped in transferring money to people at, at a huge scale, very useful during the pandemic. Yeah. Then of course, NPCI launched uh, UPI, which transformed payments. Now ONDC is looking at disaggregating commerce. So they have a whole host of things. Uh, Akestep has contributed to building the underlying architecture for uh, Diksha through Sunbird. So I think doing these things at scale requires uh, architecting it properly, making it low cost, making it open source, allowing small transactions, billions of transactions. And I think our view that rather than trying to solve a thing for a few people, solve it for everybody and solve each, each solution does only maybe a small change, but it all adds up. And that's what you're seeing today in everybody's hands. Roini, you have been the voice for, you know, people, for Samaj and, and uh, for the civil society. I, I want to ask you that how, you know, you've talked about tech aid, where tech is the aid, is only the aid. Tell us about that. When people say tech aid, that's great. But I try to remind ourselves that tech should be the aid. So tech should not be in front. We should not be tech led as much as tech enabled. The people should be in the front. We want to distribute agency to people because otherwise, Tech can become, we have seen in some cases that technology allows the accumulation of power at the top, whereas this team cares about distributing power to the people, agency to the people, convenience to the people. And in our case at X step, how can every child or person become a better learner, a better teacher? So that's why tech is the aid. It may be India's tech aid, but we have to remember that tech is only an aid. It's not the purpose, it's the tool. Shankar. You're the CEO of Step Foundation. Can you tell us about this People Plus. You just recently did People Plus event and, and the name of the event in itself is so unique and different. Yeah, today is World Engineers Day. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, Happy World Engineers Thank Day you. for those of you who are engineers. Thank you. So as an engineer, it's a double irony that I'm talking about People Plus. Thing is, as Rohini said, if tech is an aid, if tech is a tool, if you start with a hammer, everything rapidly starts to look like a nail. Yeah. But if you start with people and you relate to people's problems, what they care about, what they are capable of, what they are willing to do, the world looks different. Yeah. And if you have 1.4 billion people with the diversity, uh, uh, complexity, 
and the size of India, there is no one solution that you can do which can scale up everywhere. So whether that solution is put money or put technology, put systems. But the successes that Nandan talked about started with the core premise of how will it transform people's lives? Mm. How will the presence of an identity transform people's lives? How will the ability to make payments transform people's lives? And as Nandan said, one small thing, but at scale, right? Uh, so if you start with people plus, then you design it. Nandan talked about architecture. You design it with keep, keeping the people in mind. What at Exeter we call as plus one design, mm. right? You start with what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, their daily habits, and then you see how can technology help? How can capacity building help? How can funding help this too? That process we wanted to honor. And that's why we say it's people plus technology to consciously remind us that it's not technology plus people. Nandan, I want to ask you, you know, uh, everyone is saying you have come up with this equation and uh, this transformation equation, which is human capital plus digital capital is equal to people plus advantage. Tell us about that. And 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 somewhere, you know, correct me, I, you know, I feel digital capital, courtesy you, uh, is way advanced in our country and, and we leading uh, the world when it comes to digital capital. Uh, but the human capital still has to unlock itself. And uh, how do you see it? And, and, and first tell us about the equation that you've come up with. Uh, India's success has been built on its human capital. Today, when you look at the IT services industry, it's a $250 billion industry with employing 5 million people. That's human capital. Today, we have uh, India is the world's largest receiver of inward remittances from the Indian diaspora. It's $108 billion a year, which is far ahead of anybody else. That's all done by human capital. And everything, all, all, India's progress depends on human capital. And I think human capital, so if we, if all the, and these are all, you know, relatively a small set of people compared to a population, right? Yeah. So if, if we can unlock everybody's human capital so that they have access to better learning, better skills, better jobs, then imagine the kind of you know, transformation that is possible. So, so we've always been big believers that human capital is the key to India's success. And we should help in enabling and activating that, which is what we're trying to do with uh, Sunbird and, and the yeah. government is doing with Diksha. It's all about finally unlocking human capital. On the digital side, what's happening is that as we do more and more digital transactions, we create a digital footprint, a digital trail. And historically, those digital footprints are not with people themselves. They are with governments or companies. With the Indian unique architecture of data empowerment, yeah. the data is with people. And now they can use that data to improve their lives. So they can use, for example, data of their salary and all that to get a consumer loan. Small businesses can use the data of their sales and purchases to get a business loan. They can, a person can use this data to get a better medical treatment and so on. So data capital is very uniquely an Indian phenomenon because we have an infrastructure architecture which allows people to have power of their own data. Yeah. And yeah. then if you combine human capital plus data capital, then, you know, all kinds of things can go to happen. And that's where the people plus advantage comes from. What would you tell the ecosystem, everyone? listening to us today in terms of the unlocking potential of this? Well, I think what we, have, what we find is there's a, we are in a hugely aspirational society. Yeah. Right? People want to get ahead. They are willing to do really amazing things. I mean, you can see the pressure of people going all the way to Kota, live there <laughs> for many years just to get a seat in uh, IIT or whatever. So clearly there's a hugely aspirational society, yeah. but they're not able to achieve their full ambition because of the lack of access to resources and so on. So we think that if we can unlock that at population scale, yeah. then people will take care of the rest. We just have to make sure that everybody has access, you know, content should be ubiquitous, uh, the job discovery should be ubiquitous, you know, credentials should be able to be travel easily. These are all unlocking frictions. Yeah. And then people's ambitions and aspirations will take, out, take care of the rest. Rohini, uh, what do you mean by collaborative ecosystem? So 30 years I've been in the civil sector, which is my primary experience and a journalist like you before that, but realized everywhere that 
no one institution or even one sector can solve problems of the kind that all of us uh, are grappling with and therefore Samaj Sarkar and Bazaar have to work together. But then to create that collaborative ecosystem, you have to design something that reduces the friction to cooperate. Yeah. Because otherwise everybody is naturally working in their silos where they are more comfortable. Yeah. So whether it was when we began in the Pratham network for education or whether they continued in Argyam through water and now especially at Ek Step, um, we try to make sure that whatever is being done is co-created with a number of experienced people and actors included in the design and in its delivery. And certainly we've tried very hard uh, to work with the government because you cannot scale anything important without the government. So you, how do you get government in? And the team also says, how can Bazaar also play a role, especially in education? There are a lot of companies in education. Yeah, yeah. How can we make it easier for them to onboard something useful for learners? So Samaj Sarkar Bazaar working together creates that collaborative ecosystem. But again, for us, it's important. It doesn't happen on its own. We have to help to reduce that friction between these sectors. But without these three coming together, um, I don't know too many examples of success for a societal problem. But when they do come together, and we saw some elements of that during the pandemic. Yes. When they do come together, things happen with more inclusion, more speed, and I think more effectiveness. So we try for collaboration at every step. Give us some examples of some of the, you know, collaborative ecosystems and, and plays that you see existing. And one thing that I wanted to ask all of you, maybe basis what Rohini said, is that, you know, today we are sitting on this table and many people could get access to ta the different tables coming from different backgrounds is basis the education we got. And ed education is the only lever which can change anything, anything. And I have huge respect for Eight Step Foundation because you're trying to make that open. As Eight Step Foundation, we set about asking how can we reach 200 million children in five, six years. And as we delve into the problem, we realize that in education, the problem is not just big, complex and diverse, but it's a multi-year problem. It takes 10, 12, 15 years for the child to grow there. And therefore, to reach that scale, we had to understand what are all the frictions that the system faces, whether that's the student, the learner, the teacher, the administrator, the parent. And therefore, the first few years, what we did was create a set of building blocks, which could be put together to solve certain problems. And that became the basis of Sunbirth, which on which Diksha was created. I'll illustrate this with a problem, as an example. A lot of children in India, they might get three, four square meals a day, but the only books in their house belong to the teachers, or belong to the education system, textbooks. So if the only books in the house are the textbooks, they cannot go beyond. What if at the point of reading the textbook, they could access more content, mm. interactive content, digital content, relevant to the chapter and blessed by the board or has a stamp of approval of the board. Trusted content, relevant content, just-in-time content. But the designing of this in a way that India's 60 boards can decide which textbook, where in the textbook to put the QR code, what digital mm. content, create the digital content, that was what we architected. And that became the first powerful use case of Diksha, which then rapidly climbed to most states adopting it in the first three, four years. And when the pandemic came, that uh, took off. So Diksha is a national platform for school education, part of the Prime Minister's Eid Vidya. It's hugely successful. It's called as the world's largest, most diversified school platform. It has content in 36 languages, including some dialects. We do not have a script. Uh, it also has content in Daisy, which is the language for the different layers. 300,000 plus pieces of content. All Eight Step did was provide the building blocks of Sunbird, which the government took and created the platform we helped them with, worked with the states who decided which textbook, which content, and therefore a massive ecosystem had to come together to create Diksha. So when I say People Plus, we started with the child and the teacher in mind and designed something where progressively more and more ecosystem players would come on top. We already talked about friction. Technology 
could solve one big friction which is access technology could solve another friction which is access to digital content mm-hmm. so diksha was one example but because it was built using sunbird some of it could also be used in devop if you have a vaccination certificate and that has a huge qr code that qr code is in a way connected to the same qr code in textbooks so again goes back to nandan's point about digital public infrastructure but you create something others should be able to use it so devop and more than a billion indians therefore have a little bit of sunbird in them right 250 million children and 7 8 million teachers have a little bit of sunbird in them they won't know it but some of the problems are getting solved we are all from five different states if we speak in a native language we will not be able to understand each other so in india language becomes a divide can it become a bridge through technology can ai be used in that that's a quest we started 3 years ago and there also we partnered with iit madras with the government of india ministry of information technology whose mission is bhashani so we provided technical support uh, to the government of india financial support to iit madras and so bhashani also created as a public good has many ecosystem players is now being used across judicial health agriculture by startups by government ministries by institutions way beyond and so diksha bashini i got is the diksha for government civil service by the government of india right already a million plus civil servants are being trained on it so you see the starting point of all of this may be some technology but to achieve impact so many other actors have to come together and that's the our belief got a uh, you the chief growth officer at ekta foundation so tell us why should the ecosystem be interested and that is my question they look at this as an opportunity right and connecting to that opportunity to amplify the cares that they have uh what kind of cares i mean shankar just spoke about the example of diksha now diksha needed a lot of content on it content in 36 languages and and for that to happen for the 60 boards uh including ncert one option was they could have done it themselves right but the content that you need for learning of students for training of teachers etc etc and so many different languages so many boards grades medium subjects you need diversity right now to do it themselves it would have taken them a lot of time lot of effort but by involving the ecosystem and the ecosystem of private sector players social sector players individuals who are willing to give why because this connected to their care of being able to make a contribution towards social impact and also see how this contributes to something which can happen at that massive kind of scale so i think connecting to those opportunities to amplify the care that people have is the reason why uh, the ecosystem comes together let me take another example again shankar was speaking about the sunbird uh, uh, collective and uh, how sunbird is now a little bit of a part of all of our lives in different ways through different manifestations there are now around uh, 50 plus manifestations leveraging sunbird and its different building blocks why do people make use of sunbird because these are digital building blocks which accelerate the journey for the creation of a solution which can uh, lead to this the people centered transformation across diverse sectors and uh, so so why should i build everything from scratch of course you can but when you take a digital building block it which can manifest uh, itself in different shapes and forms uh, it just accelerates your journey it becomes much more cost effective so why wouldn't you want to use it and that's why you know uh, adoption by so many players now why do people contribute to it so those organizations and the developer community if they were to do it all by themselves again it's a tall task but when they come together the number of deployments that it has seen uh, the kind of adoption that they have seen and how it has not just gone across multiple sectors in india but actually in a few countries as well it's the power of the collective so by coming together by connecting to this they see growth and opportunities for themselves which in turn amplifies their cares as well so they come in to amplify their cares and you know see the and that's why they connect with this in terms of seeing an opportunity to add on to what gaurav said if you see covid vaccination 
Mm. You might have got your vaccination at a private hospital. Yeah. Second time might be at a different hospital, right? So private players were involved. The choice was yours. You were at the center. You didn't have to go to the same hospital. You could have gone to any hospital in India. If it is uh, I got the civil servant, right? The government has a choice of buying courses from whoever. So the market is created for content and therefore the players providing content, all they have to do is provide. Even with Aadha, there was a market created for enrollment, right? So innovation has to come from the private sector. Bhashini. There are many startups who are now looking at using Bhashini as a building block to create applications and solutions in Indian languages. They will innovate, they will take the risk, and if they succeed, they will make a lot of money, right? That is an essential part of the uh, Sarkar Samaj Bazaar. Sarkar is needed to make sure inclusion happens for governance. Samaj is needed to ensure equity happens. Bazaar is needed to ensure innovation happens. Each has a role to play. Yeah, but you know, education, don't you think it's a very complex, uh, what should I say, uh, play here in our country in India because one is of course government does a lot of uh, things and, and and what you're doing with HDF Foundation, you're actually the creating the foundation that a lot of people have access uh, and democratizing education but education also historically has also been very divided and there's a lot of capital and there's a lot of private market in it. Do you see this making it, uh, you know, making a dent in the way we have uh, run education or, or education runs in a country. We have to not see it as one versus the other. I think we have the world's largest young population. Yeah. They all have to learn not only basic skills, but they also need to learn advanced skills. AI is accelerating the pace of change. So you have to learn new skills all the time. That may come from a, a, a private place. It may come from a government school may come from an NGO-run school. I think we should not spend too much time on that because all of them are required. Mm. And how do we... But we need to have a way of loosely coupling them with networks, which is why the networks work. So that we can, you know, I can get part of my education here, get a certificate, go there. The whole thing has to be very fluid. Mm. And so I, I don't see them as choices. It's, we have to put everyone to the wheel to make, to crack this big challenge we have. Yeah. We have chosen a mixed education system with both private and public players and people make choices. And uh, I think some of the work, the what he calls building blocks, the foundation that is being provided, supported very much by the government, is allowing actually market players to add their own premium offerings on top of it. Mm. So okay. while yeah. we care about inclusion and access to all, huh. market players can get new opportunities to innovate on top of what is being built here. So that's their interest, obviously. So yeah, yeah. I, I see, therefore, a synergy. Why networks? It goes back to this, right? You, you're trying to solve uh, or enable the solving of something for a billion plus people, very diverse, different parts of the country, different languages, different uh, priorities. Yeah. And you can't do it with one company or one solution or one homogeneous thing. You need to open it up so many solutions can emerge which can all talk to each other. So network essentially allow that. For example, if you look at ONDC as a network, there the idea is that you unbundle commerce, whether it's commerce for goods or services or mobility. And rather than having one provider doing everything, different providers do different parts of that. And then, but because of the protocols in ONDC, they all can discover each other. So I can be a a small supplier, I list on ONDC, anybody can buy from me, yeah. from any app they have. I can have it delivered by somebody else and so on. So I think that that it just enables rapid scaling up uh, to bring everybody into the game. So it's a very inclusive approach. Same thing with Honest, where you know some people bring in content, some people bring in financial aid, some people bring in uh, you know uh, the, the credentialing, somebody else demands it. So once you make all this through interoperable networks, then some new person can just yeah. latch on to this and, and the whole thing expands. How does the idea of networks appeal to the social sector? So social sector, Samaj institutions have always thrived on networks. You cannot create people's movements for something without 
understanding how to actually connect dots, people, institutions, geographies. So for anything, you can see some of the big things that have been done in the social sector in the last few decades, but there's even something like NREGA. It took a lot of social organizations to work with the government together. Any of them, right to information, the Forest Rights Act, all of these things require the civil society to build networks among themselves, advocate with the government, you know, be, and so I think they understand the power of networks very instinctively. The challenge now is to get civil society into the digital world to understand the power of digital networks. Mm. How you can really increase the speed and the inclusion yeah. of the work you are doing through digital networks. So that understanding is coming quite fast. And uh, we hope that some of this like Sunbird is going to give people wings to, uh, to be included in some of the very progressive policies that governments are putting into place. Gaurav, tell us about Honest and, uh, you know, how do you see these uh, networks growing? So, uh, actually, these are early days for Honest. So, I can reflect upon a few key learnings that we are seeing in this context. Uh, one learning that we see is that the adjacencies will definitely have a big role to play uh, in the context of networks. So I'll take an example. So, a private player who provides auto rides to people in Bangalore and is now scaling across the country, they want to skill the auto drivers on soft skills. And they also want to offer scholarships to their children. Now, for this private player, if they were to do it themselves, yeah. uh, it's going to be really hard, right? Because that's not my core competence, that's not my core business. But uh, there are others, other platforms on the networks, which uh, on the network, which actually can provide the scaling course, they can provide the scholarships. So by plugging into the network without doing this entire thing uh, by themselves, that particular uh, private auto, uh, auto rights player can actually offer these services and capabilities to the auto drivers, right? So that's one example. The, other thing that we also see again in the early days is that uh, there are new newer possibilities that are emerging. And uh, again, let me take an example. So now an affordable private school in Rajasthan can have its own branded learning app, mm. uh, school branded learning app, right? Uh, they were brought onto the network by a social sector player. Uh, the app for them is being developed by a technology player, of course, which is a typical market technology player, which would got money uh, for doing that. But they, they are only developing the app. The content on that is co coming from platforms which can actually easily offer content. And guess what? The affordable private school doesn't have to pay for it because there are individuals who are on a grant making platform who are offering support to that, yeah. right? So now, where can you see this happening? Because in a typical platform, there are buyers, there are seekers, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, sellers, right? But in this case, it's the platforms which are coming together and by plugging into it, the network empowers these kind of newer possibilities to happen. Yeah. So, so, so such possibilities are kind of showing up. And I think as uh, Nandan was mentioning that uh, in this context, as different platforms come and join the network, it's the combinatorial power of these platforms, which allows the network to create these adjacencies and these newer possibilities. And that's what is creating excitement. I mean, of course, we are excited by it. And those who are joining the network are also very excited by it. Now, let's see where it goes. Everyone is talking about generative AI and we cannot be talking to you without asking. What do you think about it and how do you see it unfolding? Well, I think generative AI is very exciting. It is a force multiplier in many ways. It's opening up new vistas of thought and possibilities for, for all of us. Obviously, we also have to safeguard against its uh, harms, whether it's hallucinations, bias, all the other issues that people are raising. So we have to have the right guardrails. But I think in our Indian context, of course, we are again saying people plus AI. So what does it mean for people and so on? So one clear thing which is obvious to us is the application in learning. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we, as I said, we have learning, we have multiple challenges, right? We have yeah. a lot of people who don't have all the basic skills of reading and so on, which we see from the 
ASA report and all that. So we need to see how they can learn better mm. their own mother tongue or English and those kind of things. And at people with skills, we have to also, how do they learn new skills quickly? Mm. So there are two different parts to it. So I think, uh, I think using these generative AI for improving learning outcomes for people will be a huge opportunity for us and positively impact, uh, you know, India in a very positive way. And then the other question is, how do we use all this technology to create uh, assistance? How do you amplify human potential? Because we'll always have a shortage of doctors. We'll always have a shortage of nurses. We'll always have a shortage of teachers. Is there any way to make them do more things with an assistant, which is using generative AI? I think there are a lot of uh, possibilities there. And we can also use this to make complicated things simple for users because you can hide the complexity of knowledge and put a chatbot in front of that, which is able to you know, yeah. give you answers. Yeah. So I think all this is going to expand economic opportunity for everyone. So we are excited and we are looking at it again. What, what does it mean at population scale? Then there are issues of how to make it cheap, you know, low yeah. inference cost, you know, the number of technological issues. But if we can actually make people-oriented solutions for, uh, for the country, I think it will be a huge force multiplier. What does now the next 10 years unfold for us? Well, I think the next 10 years is about one is, I would say we are halfway on the journey. Hmm. Uh, we obviously have to make it work at scale in education and improve learning outcomes. So everybody is well educated and has the skills for the new era. We have to use it to amplify healthcare yeah. uh, and make sure that people have access to healthcare. And again, how, how can we digitally amplify that? Uh, we have to, you know, continue the work on making India as a single market so that we can, you know, businesses can sell anywhere and, uh, you know, easy to ship and so on and so forth. Uh, we're also going to see an era where brands are going to get built because, uh, you know, the normal uh, modes of distribution will go away. Because distribution, ONDC, all these things will make it very easy to distribute. Yeah. So finally, how people decide really based on brands. So I think the brand thing is going to go up. So there are many, many changes happening, but I think it's going to be a very interesting time because we have successfully solved uh, social inclusion through Aadhaar and so on. We have solved financial inclusion through bank accounts and so on. We are solving economic inclusion through credit. Mm. Uh, so I think all this is creating a new model of equitable growth, yeah. which is actually very unusual in the world, which is why people are not able to put their hands around it because it's not been done before. Yeah. So I think it's going to be exciting 10 years. What is in store for each step? Well, Nandan's uh, laid down the equation. People plus advantage is equal to human capital plus digital capital. Uh, we're excited by a whole bunch of things that we see. The power of AI, which will not only disrupt, but we can use it to leapfrog. We're excited by the power of open networks which is a model beyond platforms, right? And uh, we don't realize it, but we all are thankful to the OG of open networks, the interconnected network, aka the internet. We are excited by, given India's demographic population, the, the young population, mm. the opportunity for lifelong learning. And if you connect these three, AI plus open networks plus lifelong learning, it puts us in a very good position to uh, take our human capital from where it is and maybe in 10 years or so to a place where we can fulfill our potential as a country. But we're also cognizant that this is best done through collaboration. This is best done when the three pillars of society come together. Mm. That is extremely difficult and we are learning with each passing day. And, uh, uh, that's why we named ourselves Eight Step. Any long journey has to be taken one step at a time. And uh, to paraphrase Steve Jobs, we have covered many steps, but we continue to stay hungry and stay foolish as we create new models and work with uh, the, the whole massive uh, ecosystem to hopefully transform India and through that inspire the world. Uh, Rohini, if you could share with us some of the steps that you're taking in Eight, eight Steps as, we, as you move forward. Yeah, so you've heard all, about all the technology and all the excitement about AI and networks. But one thing that's exciting me personally is what we've taken on now, which is the whole, there's still some gaps in foundational learning. 
if these 25 million children born every year in India can have a very solid foundation in the first eight years hmm. and successive governments, NGOs, everyone has tried for it. But I think there's still a little way to go. But now is the opportunity to close that gap. We really believe it. So we've launched something together with many organizations called Bachpan Manao, Celebrate Childhood. We think childhood itself is the biggest teacher. We have to let our children learn from childhood itself. Let adults remember the child in themselves mm. and enable children. Yes, there is a tech enablement platform behind this idea. But how do we unleash the joy of childhood itself to allow 25 million children a year to come into a very solid learning journey? It's within our reach. And if we all do it together, so that's something I'm very excited about. We believe very much in distributing the ability to solve mm -hmm. rather than push. So every parent, every teacher, every community can get involved in Bachpan Manao. We believe that we need unified, a unified vision that we want foundational learning for all children. But it need not be uniform. So everyone in their way can uniquely contribute to this unified vision. So excited about that. Yeah, and maybe is outside hope that if the 140 million children in the age group of zero to eight, if we celebrate the childhood as the billion plus adults, we could discover the rediscover the child in us, and yeah. that would be a fun society. Yeah, if we are all childlike, that would be something to aspire for. Yeah, it's nice when the engineers and techies talk like that. It One makes me even happier. Yeah, that. But your uh, your passion and enthusiasm makes you know one feels like. But <laughs> thank you.